Yes, and it is a privilege to have with us today Representative Kat Kamek, and she is just this wonderful, dynamic leader. Uh, um, she's been in uh, Congress for uh, um, uh, briefly now, running for uh, re-election, but is already making a name for herself because she leans right into the issues that matter to us. This is this is a leader who cares about her values and isn't afraid uh, to defend them, and she's very relatable, and it's just this absolute privilege. Um, we're going to ask you, uh, remember, we want you to like this video. We want you to share it. Uh, uh, we want you to comment because uh, um, the more feedback that you give, uh, we, we want to spread the word. Uh, uh, in the last three weeks, as we've seen, uh, we had uh, uh, President Biden attack women, uh, try to erase women uh, with the changes that he's pursuing with, with Title IX. That was followed the next day after that executive order with the overturning of Roe versus Wade, uh, an incredible opportunity for us to defend and protect the lives of, of people before they're born. And, and uh, then uh, last week, uh, um, uh, President Biden wasn't done, and, and uh, he issued an, an executive order to, to try to uh, preserve and expand abortion, uh, a grisly uh, practice in America. Uh, but um, uh, we're going to welcome in Congresswoman Kat Kemak, and, and she is going to talk to us. Uh, uh, Congresswoman, it's great to have you with us. It's, thank you for being on the show. Hey, so good to be with you, Craig, and shout out to all of our viewers here with us today. It's exciting to be here. Well, we're excited to have you here because a lot of people don't know this about you. They they do in the in Florida and Jacksonville area where you represent, uh, um, but you actually have a pro life story uh, as you entered this uh, beautiful world that God created. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, you know, it's a pretty personal issue to me, as as you alluded to, Craig, and uh, I tell people often that. You know, it's such a privilege and an honor to serve, um, but I'm not even really technically supposed to be here. You see, when my mom was in her late 20s and pregnant with my sister, she was due to give birth in a few days and she ended up suffering a pretty terrible stroke. And it took her over a year to learn how to walk and regain those basic motor functions. And it was then that the doctors told her that she would never be able to have kids safely again because for sure she would not make it, nor would her child. And so fast forward several years, she finds herself pregnant with me and she's scared, she's alone, she's raising uh, a daughter on her own already. And it was immediate, the doctor said, you know, you need to abort. And so she, there was a lot of pressure put on her uh, to abort me in order to save her own life. And of course, once my grandparents found out uh, because she was scared and tried to hide me for as long as she could. Um, she was feeling pressure from both her family and doctors. And against all odds, she was truly um, a fighter in that moment. And she, nine months later, gave birth to a healthy baby girl, me. And I'm so proud of the decision that she made. And I'm here today because of my mom's bravery. So when we talk about this issue... It's very personal because, you know, this was back in 1988, and uh, that's when there weren't a tremendous amount of resources out there for women who were in that particular situation relative to now. And so I'm really grateful for my mom and her courage and her bravery and excited that hopefully my story can maybe help save some lives and encourage women that there are real options out there. So proud to be part of this pro-life movement. Well, as I, I say a lot in, in uh, over the years in my work, that uh, God has never made a throwaway person. And that includes your mother and that includes you. And uh, there are complicated stories. And, and I could hear it in your voice that um, I could hear that it's difficult to talk about, but in a joyful way. Uh, yeah. um, you know, it's just a wonderful, wonderful um, expression of, of the love you have for your life and your, your mother there. And and um, what what she endured, and um, so you you've known that story for a long time, and you may or may not have known that in your you know first term in Congress, you're the youngest Republican in the country uh, um, serving in Congress. You're you're a young lady, as you said, you were born in 1988, uh, uh, the year I graduated high school. I guess I'm getting a little <laughs> bit long in the two. Uh, um, but it's wonderful to have a new generation of leaders uh, in Congress, such as yourself. And uh, all at once, the Supreme Court overturns Roe versus Wade. 
tell us about your reaction uh, to something you couldn't possibly have predicted when you ran for office. No, you know, it's um, it's been really a remarkable 18, 19 months up until this point of serving. You know, I actually, it wasn't until um, a few months out from, from my election that um, my, my pro-life story came out. I'm, I'm a pretty private person in, in different ways. And that was just a story that I had never shared publicly. And in fact, we were, um, talking with our, our TV commercial production team as we were building out campaign commercials and they, you know, asked me, why are you pro-life? And I started sharing my story and everybody's jaw just kind of dropped and they're like, oh my gosh, you've never shared that. Why? And I'm like, you know, it's just a personal family story. And, and it was really in that moment that I understood the weight and the impact that it had on the people around me and that it could very well save lives. And so I started to talk about it more. And as I was really getting involved deeper and deeper with the pro-life movement, I realized that we were going to be the post-Roe generation. And that became really a calling of we need to be pro-life, not just in the womb, but beyond. And so we started talking about how we can support pregnancy crisis and resource centers, um, how we can uh, foster a more favorable adoption environment, and how we can support working moms, particularly those that are on their own. And I just, I never thought that it would happen so fast. I mean, talk about a blessing, but in this, in the midst of this crazy hyper political gridlock that we've got going on up here in Washington, DC, to have such a monumental ruling come down as quick as it did was, it was like a bomb went off. And that was, it was, it was wonderful because it, for, for the first time in a long time, there was a recognition of the law catching up to the science and for it to really be a, a signal of this is a win for the sanctity of life movement, but also for the sanctity of our constitution. And I just, I always come back to the point of, yes, I have a personal story, but I also believe in our country so much. And how can we be the land of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness if we don't stand up for life? And so it's been, um, a little bit shell shocking, honestly, because I think not everybody was prepared for it. I, I know even some of my colleagues who have been um, right alongside me in this, they were like, I can't believe how fast this came down. My goodness. And, you know, thankfully I'm from the sunshine state where uh, governor Ron DeSantis had taken action at the state level to protect life. But a lot of states are playing catch up right now. So now it's a, a big hustle at this point. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I want to share something with you. This isn't, you know, on my list of questions, but I, I love your transparency and that you're willing to share this. I, I worked for a man named Chuck Colson, who you may not know. He was two generations ago for you, one for me, uh, but he brought me in and he taught me how we could use our experience to help other people. He mm -hmm. was involved in Watergate, turned his life around uh, when, when uh, he surrendered in Christ and gave back and, and changed the criminal justice system. I was involved in the criminal justice system and recovery for addiction. And he said, you know, that's the most valuable contribution you could make because most people talking about issues in our country don't haven't experienced any part of it. And, mm -hmm. and God can use what, what you don't think is important. Uh, um, that's the most important thing in the contribution. And I just love hearing you saying that your willingness to do this, because I do think we have a lot of people shouting at each other, particularly pregnancy resource centers. Mm -hmm to say um, what they think ought to happen there, but you know what? They haven't been where your mother was. Mm -hmm. And, and, and uh, you, you've, uh, um, you probably don't recall your youngest years, but she told you the stories about how difficult that was with your older sister and you mm -hmm. and everything. And, and now they're attacking, they're firebombing, including the, our Wisconsin uh, location and, and um, several others around our country. Uh, what, what's your what's your take on that? What what can we be doing about that? How important is it for the voices of folks like yours that say, "Wait a second, this is a service agency"? How how do we help people understand what what that is? Well, and I think that's just one. Violence has no place in in our political discourse. Hard stop. Full stop. I, I think of what's happening right now with the justices and how their homes have become targets. Their families have been targets. You know, there was an assassination attempt on one of our justices. 
and you don't see an outrage from the left. You tend to see only those speaking out on the right about how horrible this is and how we all need to collectively come together, not as Republicans or Democrats, but as Americans and say, there is no place, full stop, hard stop for violence in our society. When we are talking about politics, when we are talking about decisions that are to be made that have tremendous consequences, but they're rooted in a constitution that has given us the country in order to be able to go out and protest, to have that First Amendment right. And I just think that we are at a place where people treat the constitution a little bit like a menu, a little bit like, I'm going to treat this a little a la carte, if you will. And they're going to say, I'm going to choose to uphold this amendment one day, but not this one the next. And this whole picking and choosing what we want to uphold and when it's convenient or politically um, expedient for us, that is when it gets very dangerous. And what we're seeing with the violence and the targeting of pregnancy centers, this is, this is the result of that. And so I like to say that, again, we have to condemn violence on both sides at all times. There is no middle ground. There is no gray area. Violence cannot, should not be tolerated by the right or the left. And the fact that there are people out there who are willing to commit violence and to commit crimes over an issue that I believe is murder, right? Uh, when uh, when you look at this issue and I talk about how science has been catching up to this and, and I talk about this in, in this way because not many people do. Um, and I'll come back to the, the part about the violence, but when you think about the federal government and how we classify bacteria on Mars as life, this is an official government position, but yet we can't classify that beating heart and neural activity as life in the womb. And you take it one step further, look at the DOJ. The DOJ says that a pregnant woman who is murdered, that is a double homicide, but not if she makes the decision to terminate that child's life at whatever stage. So there's a real disconnect at the federal level in this confusion that has existed. And when I say that the law has caught up to the science, it has. We can prove that a child feels pain. We can prove when a heart starts beating. We can prove when the development is starting. And that DNA is unique to that child. And that's two heartbeats. And so I think it's really interesting the the conversation that is happening, but it's also very dangerous what's happening. Because I go back to where people want to cherry pick what laws they want to uphold and when and however it fits into that narrative. And so I think if we're going to get back to a place where we are Americans, not black versus white or Republicans versus Democrats, I think we need to get back to a place of understanding that the Constitution, it is not up for interpretation of what is going to be in and what is going to be out. And we have to recognize that our constitutional republic exists today, gives us the freedoms that we have, and we have to protect that document at all costs, which in turn, again, I go back to, we are a nation founded on the notion of life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. And your rights stop the minute they start infringing on someone else's. And what we're seeing is someone's First Amendment rights that they are claiming as they're stomping and screaming and chanting and vandalizing and taking these horrible, violent actions against people who don't agree with them. And they're saying, well, this is my right. But we have to remember that those rights stop the minute that you take the rights of someone else away. Well, I am. I just I love your heart and I love the way you describe it. And I want all of our viewers to understand what she said. I want to repeat it back a little bit because it's important. Yeah. We should not pick and choose which civil liberties are the most important or least important. They're articulated. There's not that many of them. And that's our Constitution. That's our Bill of Rights. And it's been added to with things like the 14th Amendment that say that we're supposed to be treated equally. And our country is a whore. Our country was the first one to say that we were going to try to treat people equally. Yeah. We've not yet got there. We, we said black people weren't fully human. We said women weren't fully human, right? We, we had to go through growing pains and, and, and fights and, and, and a war and with one of them and, and constitutional amendments. But equality is equality. A person is a person. And equality means that a, a person that um, hasn't been born is equal to a person that has been born. It's just, you know, and, and, and um, 
but we got a long fight ahead of us, uh, uh, Congresswoman. I'm, I'm uh, joined here today. Thank you all for watching. Uh, um, we want you to share. We want you to like. We want you to comment on. Uh, I have Congressman, uh, Congresswoman uh, Kat uh, uh, Kimak with me, and, and we are talking. She represents Jacksonville, Florida. She's the youngest Republican elected. Uh, um, she's serving in her first term, and she has a pro-life story that is just absolutely uh, touching, and she's been a leader uh, because of her own experience, her mother's experience, her family's um, in the pro-life movement. Um, what what should we, what can we be doing from that perspective uh, at the federal level? We, we may not be able to uh, outlaw yeah. abortion uh, this session or, or maybe even the next. We'll see what God has in store for that. But um, what are some of the things that we can be doing, Congresswoman, at the federal level? Well, you know, and that's where I, I'm so glad you you asked that because so much of the discussion in the last few weeks has been highly charged, emotional, um, and I think it's important that people take a step back and recognize that our founding fathers they were brilliant in how they structured our federalist system. What this ruling did, the Dobbs v. Jackson case. It really returned, and I and you heard me say it earlier, you know, this isn't just a win for the sanctity of life, but for the sanctity of our Constitution, because this is a nod and a hat tip back to the Tenth Amendment, where this issue now returns to the states, where I believe, because I am a small government constitutional conservative, I believe that a individual's voice is more powerful because it's closer to the people. When you have your state elected officials, your governors, your 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 local officials, they work in a more coordinated, closer to the constituency aspect than, than federal representatives do. And so I think this is really a win for people and for we the people, because now your voice is multiplied and amplified and stronger, much stronger when you have smaller government. And so I think that from the federal standpoint, we need to recognize that codifying Roe, as Biden has repeatedly said he wishes us to do, it's not going to happen. Uh, because what they are asking us to do is to codify the House's uh, so-called Women's Health Care Protection Act. I have read this bill because I make a point to read the bills. There is nothing about women's health care that is in this bill. And it allows uh, someone to terminate a pregnancy, to murder their own child the day before delivery. That is a full term situation that would be legal in the United States. And that is not a that is not a pro-choice. I mean, there's no, there's absolutely no justifiable reason why that should ever, ever happen in in anywhere around the world. And so what's going to happen now is that the House has passed that bill. We fought it tooth and nail, and it rests at the Senate. From the federal standpoint, we have to preserve the filibuster in the Senate so that there is no chance that this ever were to become law. Because as I said, abortion is not health care. And when we talk about the pro-life movement, it's really talking about empowering women. And this bill, this effort that we're seeing at the federal level to so-called codify Roe is anything but empowering women. And it is going to blow up the filibuster, which will open up Pandora's box, not just on the issue of abortion and the pro-abortion lobby movement that is that is out there, but on so many other issues that seek to disadvantage uh, women and minorities and working class and, and people around this country that aren't politically connected. And so we have a lot of, of work to do ahead of us. And it starts with preserving the filibuster in the Senate so that we can make sure that this terrible, terrible bill never sees the light of day. Well, and uh, just just one last question. And I'm going to ask you for some, we, we always end with an encouragement, but before we get to the encouragement question, mm -hmm. uh, um, you mentioned women and, and they yeah. called their bill, the women's empowerment or whatever, uh, uh, healthcare. healthcare thing. Uh, uh, they're, they're playing. Uh, it, it's like uh, uh, Pontius Pilate said, uh, what is truth? Bill Clinton said, it depends on what the meaning of is, is. And now they're trying to redefine gender, you know, and, and saying yeah. a woman doesn't exist, uh, um, you know, and all these other uh, uh, lies and until their backs are against the wall. So they want women to exist the day that they vote on this bill. But for the most part, they're, they're trying to cancel women. You, you've been a, a very, very powerful uh, uh, and inspiring voice. Um, 
um, married to a very strong woman, uh, Stacy, and I have three beautiful daughters uh, that play sports um, that uh, like, loved and they, they've learned in their civics classes about the hard fought civil rights that women have gained. And, and, and I, Title IX is, is a huge win, huge win. Mm -hmm. um, on par with the Civil Rights Act for, for African-Americans in 1964. And that is being systematically dismantled. Could you tell us what your perspective is on, on what the president is doing with Title IX? And uh, it's just shocking. Yeah, no, I'm really glad that you brought that up um, because what Biden has done in really trying to take on Title IX to remove biological sex and put in, replace it essentially with gender identification. It's a slap in the face to every woman, to every girl, and every parent who has fought tooth and nail to get to this point. Heck, it wasn't too long ago that I remember in high school that the girls' golf team didn't exist and they wouldn't let me play on the boys' team. So we created the girls' team. Now they just want it to be either co-ed or the boys team, and there won't be a girls option. And so we have to understand that all these young athletes and these professional athletes that have dedicated their lives to their sport, they're not losing titles and podiums and trophies. They're being stolen. This is an injustice that needs to be rectified. Uh, it wasn't too long ago, a couple of weeks, when we celebrated the 50th anniversary of Title IX and we held a press conference on the steps of the Capitol. And I stood shoulder to shoulder with some of our American Olympian athletes, um, high school national stars, collegiate athletes at the top of their game in Division I sports. And they have said that they just want the chance to compete. And they're being denied that chance because of a boy who is a biological male who has a physiological advantage to them that cannot be overcome in so many of these sports. And it really, like I said, it's just a slap in the face. And this is not a partisan issue. I stood there with Democrats and Republicans, and we collectively agree that women's sports need to be protected at all costs because it's not right and it's not fair. And if we are truly going to be the nation of equal opportunity, then it needs to be set in stone that there are men's sports and there are women's sports. And I just don't think that there's any room for any kind of asterisk that will come with uh, the sports if we continue to allow biological men to compete with women. And uh, so we got a long road ahead of us, but it kind of feels like we're living in, in clown world right now. Just one day women's rights is about abortion and according to the left. And then the next day men can be in women's sports. It's, it's just kind of a wild time to be in Washington. It's a, it's a very dark time. Uh, yes. um, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say that I, I can't wait until we, uh, thank you. This is your first time on with our audience. Uh, it's such a joy to have you and our audience is going to love you. And and I just, your answers to these questions are so uh, uh, deep and, and impressive. Um, it is an injustice. And I don't think most people think of it that way. Uh, they minimize it by saying words like fairness. No, no, no. Somebody caused harm. Somebody was harmed and it did affect the community. The definition of an injustice uh, every time that that occurs. And, and, uh, and um, so I, I just love your perspective and, and I could, Tell it is rooted in some very deeply held values, and we can't wait to have you back. But this is a difficult time, and 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 we know that we have to endure more months of this. Maybe uh, um, give our audience some encouragement because right now our audience is very involved in yes. their local church, in their community. Uh, they're the ones in in Virginia, in New Jersey that rose up. They're you know with the school boards and the other things, uh, and they want to know: um, is it fruitless or? Or, or is this important what they're doing right now, Congresswoman? Uh, uh, so we'll we'll send send us out with uh, some encouragement today. Well, Craig, again, thank you so much for having me on, and to all of our viewers out there today. I know how frustrated it can be. I know how tired and disheartened and and really just run down we all feel. I, I know because I am right there with you most days. But then I remember that we are Americans and there's something unique, 
something within our DNA that no one else has, and that is American grit. We are perpetually underdogs. We thrive when our backs are up against the wall and we do our best when the clock is ticking, the pressure is on, and all hope seems to be lost. We are the nation of good guys. We thrive in env environments where there seems to be no way out, mission impossible. Heck, they made movies about mission impossible always being possible. But again, if you tap into that thing that has given us that edge for over 230 years, it's that American grit, it's that scrappiness that continues for us to dig deep, to really think long and hard about how we continue to fight. Because if there's one thing that we know, it's that you never, ever, ever, ever give up. Because if you do, they win. So never lose the faith, never give up, and always remember where you get your grit and your grace from. Amen to that. Well, what a absolute privilege. Thank you so much, Congresswoman. It, it, this has been a, a very big treat. I know our audience is going to love it. Please continue to share uh, this wonderful interview and comment on it with your friends on social media. And Congresswoman, we'll have you back real soon. Thanks again. Thank God you bless. so much. Thank you, Craig.